today on Call Out. Rosalind and Nelson search and rescue deal with a ski fatality in the backcountry. At this time, uh, it's too dangerous uh, to go in. There's a large overhanging avalanche risk. We'll have to wait to the morning and then assess it. And later, military search and rescue technicians, Sartex, show trainees how to survive and save lives in the Arctic. All these buildings are off limit to you guys. If you need something, come and see an instructor and we'll get you what you need, okay? Monday, 3.50 p.m. A call comes in to Rosslyn Search and Rescue. There's been an avalanche involving four skiers in the remote backcountry. The team hooks up their mobile command center and heads towards Nancy Green Junction, a central point for other SAR members converging on the area, including South Columbia, Castlegar, and two members from Nelson Search and Rescue. Dave Braithwaite, an avalanche technician, finishing carpenter, and longtime Rossland SAR member, was one of the search managers on the call. Radio check, radio check. In this avalanche, there'd been a fatality and other people involved. So our response was to be fairly major. It was a big area and a long way out. So we've got a number of snowmobilers and a number of skiers prepared to go and access the area. The avalanche has occurred in the Mount Mackey area an outdoor adventurer's playground in the West Kootenai region, just north of the U.S. border. Backcountry skiers often use snowmobiles to find fresh powder on their own terms. But the danger of avalanches lies just beneath the snow on the steep mountain slopes. When it struck, one skier was buried and carried down to the base of a glade of trees. Big Red Cats Limited, a well-known local cat ski company that provides guided backcountry ski trips and was not involved in the incident, receives a call from one of the surviving skiers. They said that one of their group had been caught in an avalanche and they thought he was dead, uh, but only one of them had seen them. So I then jumped on a sled, uh, drove to the top of that mountain, put on my headlamp because it was then getting dark, uh, skied down and found the subject and confirmed that, you know, that he was deceased. At this time, uh, it's too dangerous uh, to go in. There's a large overhanging avalanche risk. We'll have to wait to the morning and then assess it. Night falls. Inside the mobile command center, the teams are evaluating the best strategy to recover the deceased skier. Knowing that the other skiers involved in the incident are safe and out of the area, one of the first priorities is to block public access to the avalanche location. Lots of people, for some reason, would find their way to get pictures or find out what's going on. They would access some road. I can get in from here and off they would go. And there could be a, more danger there with more avalanches and also the fact that we just don't want anyone to go in there. The RCMP would like to be the first people on the scene. As teams settle in for the night in their trucks, blocking off roads leading into the avalanche area, another rescue call comes in. We have also now been informed of another missing snowmobiler in uh, the mountain, uh, Murphy Creek area, and uh, we are sending some crews on the road on snowmobiles to search for this person. This is our second time seeing people going out to search We found a vehicle, the RCMP checked the plights on it, confirmed this was the right one, so we had a starting point from where this fellow left from. Chris Armstrong of Nelson Search and Rescue makes his way to the second search location. Quite a large team of uh, sledders have come out to this one area called Murphy Creek outside of Rosalind to uh, set up for the second search. But it's over before it starts. There's been a uh, stand down here for the second search. The subject had reported in safe at home. Back at the SAR base, preparations for tomorrow's recovery are well underway when yet another rescue call comes in. A lone vehicle belonging to three skiers is spotted on the side of the road near Red Mountain Ski Resort. They're overdue, and with one avalanche fatality occurring already today, Rosslyn SAR aren't taking any chances. So we're just uh, making arrangements now to check the vehicle and check the area where these individuals were last seen and uh, pretty much start up a third search. So um, very busy night in Rosalind. It's a big area, 
but Dave Braithwaite knows it well. That's as far as it would be. There's nothing past that for someone hiking in. It'd be, that's the farthest likely point someone would hike up into the basin. Yeah. Why don't you come with pictures and answer it up? RCMP Corporal Gord Sims and Dave Braithwaite are on the road to check out the lone vehicle when some good news comes in. Just heard back from our complainant on our overdue skiers. The skiers are all safe and sound. Got, just got back to their vehicle and we'll be heading down the uh, mountain now. That'd be great, thanks. When we get news that someone uh, has made it home, it's a great relief to all of us and we consider that a successful call out. We were there and ready to help them if they were in need. Even at that, it's a great thing and we all go, yeah, good call out, we made it and everyone's safe. It's back to base again and time to turn in. So we're back to square one with the recovery tomorrow morning. It looks like we're gonna shut down for the evening. So we'll be back in the morning. After a busy night, the SAR teams return to the base at Nancy Green Junction to begin recovery of the deceased skier caught in yesterday's avalanche on Mount Mackey. We have a helicopter flying in from Castlegar. Um, it's our rescue pilot with uh, Nelson. We'll do a recce flight this morning with uh, Avitex to secure the site. It shouldn't take too long. We should be done by about 10 o'clock and uh, get on home to our families. Kieran Gall of Big Red Cats continues to assist the team and will fly in with another level two avalanche tech to survey the site. Above the accident site is another steep slope with unstable snow that could give way and come down on the recovery team as they evacuate the subject. Prior to going in by ground, Kieran is hoping the technicians will be able to airdrop explosives and release any remaining avalanche threat. Unfortunately, it's overcast, and they can't get in for a good look. They decide to proceed by ground. After some last-minute pointers from Kieran, they leave by snowmobile and snowcat. As the excavation team gets underway, the HETs and ground support teams move their operation closer to the recovery site. The shorter the flight, the safer it'll be for the HETS crew. We found a, an active logging site with a, a good-sized landing only two kilometers from the actual scene. We're going to use this point as a staging area for uh, flying a long line attendant into the area. Uh, right now behind me, the uh, Kootenai Heli Rescue is just uh, rigging up the helicopter. At the accident site, Kieran Gall clears a path to remove the buried skier. The path will also serve as an escape route should an avalanche let go. He's posted a lookout above the two slopes to one side and sent the rest of the team away. It's too dangerous. Kieran digs steadily to recover the subject, but is ready to take flight at the slightest warning from above. At the landing zone, the HETS hookups are double checked. The team is ready to go. We have a portable stretcher inside of our uh, evacuation device, which is our, called an ARP. We're going to long line over this ridge right there, loop around, come back. We have a subject at the base of a slide, and uh, we're going to bring him back to this site, reload him back into the machine, and take him down to our SAR base down by the highway. The helicopter takes flight to meet the recovery team. Pretty cold. It's, uh, it's been a long day. It's taken quite quite some time to package the subject, and uh, it's quite a steep, steep terrain, a bit uh, unruly. So we're just waiting right now for the uh, long line team. They've managed to get everything safely done. It's packaged. And they're inbound right now. The helicopter returns. The HETS unit is lowered to the ground. They will transfer the subject into the aircraft for the journey to the coroner and onward to his awaiting family. Search and rescue prefer a happy outcome. Maybe a close call, another chance. Sadly, that's not always the case. We had a real busy 24 hours. We had uh, over 50 people out in that time, some overnight. We managed to have two subjects come back safely to their families, and one subject was a fatality. Uh, it's always tough, but all we can do really is promote good, safe backcountry practices and be there for those people who get out there and, and are in need. Water, boy. 
Now, Canadian search and rescue technicians show trainees how to survive in the Arctic. Oh, this is very lucky that there's no wind. Super lucky. If someone needs rescue in Canada's vast wilderness, Canadian Forces Search and Rescue Technicians, SARTEX, go in when no one else will. There's instructors waiting to take you, so speed up. These 13 SARTEX trainees from CFB Comox, British Columbia, are now in the third day of an eight-day on-the-ground Arctic training phase at Resolute Bay, Nunavut, one of the coldest places on Earth. They've learned to build fighter trenches and snow caves, and have spent time in these temporary shelters, but always had the comfort of the nearby Narwhal Hotel at night. Uh, yeah, you. <laughs> I want someone to take command of this group. Day three, and the team starts preparing for a seven kilometer trek to their Sartek training camp, Crystal City. There, they'll build igloos and live outside. So this is it. This is pretty much the last time you're going to see civilization. So now we're going to move into like survival aspect. Just like Corporal Schmidt, you're going to be the navigator. The team will navigate to Crystal City using maps, GPS, and compass. Uh, halfway through the distance, we'll come across. A Navigation road. with compass is more complex in the Arctic because of the closeness to magnetic north. Ninety minutes into the trek towards Crystal City, the team stops to take a bearing. Suddenly, the march turns into a mission. There are 273 passengers on a downed aircraft, and they are the only ones available for rescue operations. Coordinates show that the plane is 1.2 kilometers away. They're close. Corporal Wallace briefs them. Just keep your head on a swivel for anything that you guys see. Pass up the chain and we'll go through Swanee, okay? So we're just looking for the last known location of the airplane. painted a scenario of a plane crash just to give them a sense of urgency to get here. Uh, once we got about 500 meters from here, we said, okay, there obviously is no plane crash. Training's over. Now we want you guys to think about survival mode. All these buildings are off limit to you guys. If you need something... Reaching Crystal City, it's go time. Now for the challenge they really came here for, learning to survive and save lives in the Arctic. They must rely on each other and their equipment to keep them safe. Going to sites, you guys are going to live in your SAR tents tonight. So all the theory you guys got, you're going to apply here, okay? That means everything. Look after each other for frostbite, work smartly, and do all that stuff, okay? The Arctic can be very dangerous. Training is done in a controlled survival environment. Guide ropes run from the detachment buildings to the area where they're building camp. If whiteout snow conditions occur, they can be reached. The camp is also roped in. These guys are stacking it for the outer rim. So we're gonna put our tent right in the square here. Put a nice wall going around it. The students construct wind walls to protect the tents they'll be sleeping in from the blowing snow. Local Inuit subject matter experts, Simon Idloud and his son Absalom, are there to make sure lessons learned at the Resolute Base Camp, cutting and shaping snow blocks, are not forgotten. The instructors let the students plan and build their own, but step in where needed. Now's the time I'd be cutting blocks, stacking them off to the side to use for later, get the tent up so I could get a cook in there and get some water on, and if I need to get someone out of the elements, I can move them into a shelter right now and save that guy's life and look after myself and my team member. The teams reconsider their plan. An important part of Arctic survival is to think in the now. Right now it's good to do this. There's no wind, then let's get the tent up. Okay, the wind's, the wind's coming, we can feel things pick up. Okay, everyone outside, let's get that wind well done now. So you have to keep changing your priorities as, as it goes. They divide the duties with a priority to get snow and ice melted into water so they can stay hydrated. You get more water out of ice than you do out of snow. Oh, this is very lucky that there's no wind. Super lucky. They're busy working on the walls, but it's not how the Inuit would do it. 
Never saw something like this before. Well, he's hoping it holds up. The wind walls that they've constructed here probably aren't the best because they're square. If you think about the wind hitting a square wall, it's like a sail. The Inuit would build igloos square if that was the case, right? They build them round for a reason so that the, the wind goes around them and, and they can sustain the winds. The students must chink the gaps between the blocks with snow, just like mortar between bricks. The snow will harden and hold strong. What he's doing? Teach us how to do it right. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, let's go, go for a walk, man. Go for a walk, warm the toes yeah. up. You still have to go uh, a couple times, like go for a walk and stuff, to get the, the blood going, otherwise you freeze. We just want to go to sleep. With tents up and wind walls built, the students concentrate on cooking and spending their first night outside in the Arctic. Sometimes, just trying to light a stove in the Arctic can be a learning experience. Smell the fuel. Well, right now we're burning the excess gas that I put. <laughs> All that gases? That's what we're that burning. That was going on right That's there. That's what we're burning right now. It's all part of the plan, right? Day four. The trainee Sartex have spent their first night outside in the Arctic. One problem we ran into had the heat pretty hot in our tent, so at night when we turn it down and just with our breathing and cold air mixing with the hot, our clothes got a little condensation on it. A little condensation can mean frozen clothes in the morning. It wasn't very nice getting up, but uh, getting into the cold air was pretty, uh, pretty crappy, but it uh, <laughs> wasn't too bad. Something like that, when you've learned a lesson in, in a cold, extreme environment like this, I guarantee you won't make that mistake the next time. Oh, one point I wanted to ask about yesterday with snow walls. Did Simon talk to you guys about chinking? A new day and a new task. They're learning to build igloos, where they'll spend the night when done. You take snow, dice it up with your snow knife, and you just, you chink it. You fill in the gap so no air is kind of seeping through. Igloos are built using snow blocks, which must be angled correctly to form a dome. Students will need all their newly learned snow block cutting, shaping, and chinking techniques to make this task a success. They'll construct the igloos side by side, with guidance from Simon and the instructors, the igloos get well underway. So it's going to sit, that flat surface is going to sit on that flat surface. That's gonna... It's not easy shaping and angling igloo blocks. You cut this one in a V. So when this one, no, not this way, the other way. It's a V. No, but the other way. It's their first attempt, but once they have the basics down like that, it's just like drywalling. And uh, drywalling with more practice, you get better at it. You didn't do anything with this angle on this block. You did it on this one, but you didn't do it on this one. If you would have, it would set. They take breaks in the tents to warm up. Yeah, it's yeah. tricky. Especially when Simon comes over, helps you for an hour. Yeah, that's, that's handy. Awesome. When Simon comes over, gives you a hand, oh, yeah. pointers on how to do things, and he, nice. he does a lot of the work for you, too. You know, just the small things like the gaps and vertical cracks. Those are the big things because you want that thing sturdy enough that it's not going to collapse through the night. And you want it thick enough that it's not going to melt eventually. They're not getting any insulation value. Day six. The igloos are done. Today we're moving from our SAR tent to our igloos. They're not digging in the snow anymore, so the cold starts to affect them more. They need to stay aware of the conditions and look after members of their team who aren't doing so well. Instructor John Elms keeps a sharp eye out for polar bears and for any signs of hypothermia. Either can be deadly. So his feet are pretty cold, right? Yeah. So now's the time maybe uh, to get him in, get, get boots go. off. Go on in here, Coco. He might be looking Unwrap. after you tomorrow. Yeah, under for sleeping bag. What? Un unwrap your sleeping bag. I was gonna change my socks. There you go. That's idea. thinking right there. Right there. Right there. When things get critical, the students need a reminder to think about the basics of Arctic survival and to focus on their work. You need to get him in there. Look after him. The other guy who's good to go. Get the stove on. Get the water going. Prioritize your work. Divvy it up and get her done. Okay. Right now they're they're hitting a bit of a wall. 
So they're, they're learning to work through that wall. Once they get themselves organized, like by tomorrow, they'll pass that wall and they'll be good to go. But this is one of those times. Minus 50 today. Minus 50. Oh, I was so cold. It's break time, and the guys are really starting to feel the cold. Now I know the cold's getting to you guys. I'm having a hard time every day as the day goes on. I don't know why it's so cold on the feet. The rest of the body, the hands is fine. It's just the feet. It's getting colder and colder as we go. Some of the students warm up inside the rigloos. No lantern in the igloo, just kudlik and candles, okay? Kudliks are like a soft candle. They are often made from blubber and used by the Inuit to light and heat tents or igloos. Sure is toasty. How is everybody? You guys seeing a little bit of difference, a little bit of change? In Six the days into their eight-day Arctic training phase, the Sartek students have learned to build wind walls, single-person snow caves, and igloos, and are now living outside 24 hours a day. Anything, we're up in the ante with the weather. In the next call-out, they build multi-person snow caves and are called out to rescue a missing hunter. Call-out search and rescue features real stories filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv.